I didn't know what to talk about. And about two weeks ago, we were out at the beach. My wife, Adele, I said, we've got to watch this thing I've taped. I've been putting off saying it. And she said, what is it? I, I said, it's, it's a, a concert. I was on PBS of Carol King and, and James Taylor. And I said, I, 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 I just been putting off, I taped it, but I've been putting off saying it. And she said, well, why? I mean, it's so unlike you even to tape that. Why, what did you want? And I said, because it reminds me, I, told, I said, it's connected, there's a song there that's connected to a certain time that I've just put out of my head. And she said, what time was that? And I said, I told her what it was that this song was connected to. And she said, well, you've never told me that before. You've told me little hints of it, but you've never mentioned it before. And I said, well, I don't have the time now, but I know I'll tell it <laughs> at City Winery. <laughs> Desperate for something to say. I mean, I wish I could tell the life of Copernicus. I wish I could talk. No, but I'm just going to talk about. I wonder whether there's times in New York when we're young. I grew up in New York, and nothing is seems further away than New York City when you're trying to be a writer, trying to be in the theater, be in that world. And then it all seems so far away and unimaginable to get into. And then you have a play, and this was in February 10th, 1971, in which date my life changed. That was a day that at the Truck and Warehouse Theater on East 4th Street, my play House of Leaves opened. And we got good reviews. And I mean, I was prepared for failure. I was prepared for everything except good reviews. <laughs> and I mean, and I got a, a t letter from Tennessee Williams saying the finest play of the last 10 years. I, but then I learned that he wrote that letter to everybody. So, but I didn't care. I have it. I had it. I had it. And Stephen Sondheim sent me a telegram on opening night. Remember telegrams? I said, dear John, have a wonderful opening tonight. Your entire future depends on it. <laughs> and that was exactly right. And we opened and the impossible thing happened. We got good reviews. And suddenly I was in a whole new city. I was a different, life was different. I had crossed through, the, the mirror had broken. I'd stepped, had I stepped to the other side? Everything, the phones were ringing, it was just, and everything was just like hallucin hallucination. It was just bright. And a few days, about a week after this extraordinary event of this play I've been trying to get on for five years to get on and finally did, a friend of mine had been in Australia making a movie, producing a movie with this man named Nicholas Rogue, great director, called Walkabout. And he wrote me from Australia and he said, the picture's having its first screening for the American distributors uh, like next Tuesday. Will you please go to it at 666 Fifth Avenue? There was a screening room there. So I went, and I have to tell you what I looked like, because what I looked like is important back then. Hey, I was taller, this is 40, 43 years ago, fuck, I was taller. And I had long hair, and I had a mustache, of course, and I wore, because I loved it, my overcoat from the Air Force. It was really warm, and I, when I got out of the Air Force, I never stopped wearing it. I was just in for six months, believe me, it was no big, but they gave me a great overcoat. So I went, and I had wire rim glasses, and I went to see this movie, Walk About, and it was, Great. I don't know if you've ever seen it about these two. It opens up with a, a, a man in a car at the edge of the desert with his two children in the back seat, and he kills himself. And the children are left alone, and they go the wrong way and walk across the length of Australia. It's a remarkable, chilling movie. Well, I was so thrilled that my friend had a success. Life was suddenly the success. And I came out of the movie just, you know, go, trying to get down to the theater that night. And I was on this Fifth Avenue stop, downtown, uh, you know, the E-train, and this blonde girl came after me and she said, excuse me, oh, oh you haven't, were you at the screening just now upstairs? I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, will you come with me? Please come with me. Please come with me. I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, just come with me, come with me. So I went upstairs, followed her, went up, and on the other side of the turnstile, there were two short, Italian men, you could tell they were Italian. 
And then she said, here he is. And I went, yeah. And they were very short. And they walked around me. And they went, hmm, hmm, hmm. I said, what is this? They said, would you please come with us? <laughs> One of the two short men was Carlo Ponti, <laughs> the movie producer. And the other short man was a man named Mario Monicelli. What? Who had made two of my favorite all-time movies, The Organizer with Mastroianni and Big Deal on Madonna Street, one of the greatest comedies ever made. And I said, yeah, what, what's up? And they said, this is what has happened. We are in a bind. We are in New York with my wife. I am married to Sophia Loren. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and we are about, we're about to start filming, but our leading man, Elliot Gould, has just had a major breakdown. <laughs> and was captured by the police running through the New York subway tunnels. I said, really? <laughs> I said, yes, Anne. And they said, well, you're about Elliot's size. <laughs> I said, yes. And, and they said, oh, would you be willing if we took a screen test of you? I, I, I said, sure. <laughs> And they gave me this car, they said, come to the studio, I guess it was somewhere in the West 40, the studio the next day. And I went. And first they gave me the script, and the script, it was called Mortadella, and it was really awful. <laughs> and I really realized Sophia would be playing a young woman whose fiance lives in America, and she works in a sausage factory in Italy. <laughs> And she comes to America bringing her husband a giant mortadella as a wedding present. And they won't let her in through customs. <laughs> Enter an Elliot Gouldish kind of New York, New York Daily News reporter. And he calls, he, come, he calls her over the customs. He said, don't give up your mortadella. What's happening to you is what's happening to all of America. Fight for your mortadella. And Sophia goes, okay. And they fall in love and he takes her anyway. I was, he said, you read the part of the Daily News reporter. Hey, Sophia, hey, Maria, don't give up your mortadella. What they're trying to do to you is what they're doing to everybody. Perfect, okay, very good. Yeah, they go on. I read the script and it kept getting worse and worse. And then there was another really had to change, put more film in the camera. And they started asking me questions. You know, and, and they were, the, the blonde would translate what they were trying to ask me, where I was from, what I did. I said I was a playwright. I had a play, you know, and, uh, you know, and I was in New York. And, uh, and then they had a trick film out. And then they had another one. They said, we just want you to talk into the camera. Say anything. So I did. I don't know what I said. That was that. I left. I gave them my lawyer's number. I didn't have an agent. I gave them my lawyer's number. Andy, my college friend, who was my lawyer. <laughs> and so the next day, I called Andy. I went back down. To the, I would go to the show every night and tell the people this, what a funny thing had happened. And Andy called the next day. He said, John. I said, did I get the part? <laughs> he said, Carlo Ponti wants to offer you a three-picture deal. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. and he said he wants you to go this afternoon, right now, to the Essex house to meet Sophia Loren, <laughs> who he's married to. <laughs> so I said, oh, can you go? For, are you for, yes. So I went to the Essex house in my Air Force uniform, you know. <laughs> and he opened the door, and it was, mo it was morning. It was not, you know, it was like 11 o'clock. And there was breakfast still all out, and there was Sophia Loren. I mean, she was just there. <laughs> and I remember I had read in some weird thing somewhere that she had had the inner edges of her eyes tattooed so she would never have to put on eye makeup. 
That seemed to be so insane. And I wanted to get close <laughs> and look into her eyes to see if her eyelid, inner eyelids were tattooed. And we hit it off great. We play, we talk back, back and forth. She was great. But she always looked at Carlo. She never looked at me. She always was very free. But her concentration was on Carlo. I didn't care. It was just great. We really got along. She was terrific. Then I had to go, and I went. As I tell you, this was a hallucinatory period, this whole period. I said, before I left, could I, I had a lot of coffee, coffee, I know, espresso. Could I go to use the, go to use the bathroom? And so I went into the bathroom, and I'm embarrassed to tell you this. But if you can't, this is where, anyway. <laughs> I closed the door of the bathroom, and when it was coming out, I saw hanging on the doorknob Sophia Loren's panties. <laughs> <laughs> and they were lace and pink. And I did so, I could be arrested maybe in some state. I took them and I put them on my head. <laughs> And I looked and I said, look at me. Johnny Guare from St. John of Arx in Jackson Heights. With Sophia Loren's panties on his head. I took them off, <laughs> you know. And Carla said, now, I, he said, what do you think of the script? I, I said, I, oh, I said, tell me about it. It's three picture deal? What are we talking? And he said, yes, he said, the first one is this one about the Mortadella, brilliant, it's wonderful. The second one is to be directed by Ettore Scuola, a scholar. Do you know him? Yes, yes, yes. And it's about a sex, a, a, a sex clinic, a, man, a young man owns a sex, a doctor owns a sex clinic, except his secret is he's impotent, and he hires Sophia as his sec secretary, as his nurse, and they work it out. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's great. And I said, and what's the third? He said, the third, this is where the contract comes in. You will be playing Vronsky to Sophia's Anna Karenina in an 18 hour television production mini series of Anna Karenina directed by Sergei Bondarchuk, who had just done the great War and Peace. Well, I said, I better get back in that bathroom and look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> Vronsky, I mean, I was flattered with Elliot Gould, but now, man. <laughs> anyway, it was fantastic. I said to him, I said, you know, this script needs an awful lot of work. He said, you're a writer? You write it. <laughs> he said, can you write tonight? I said, no, I got my play on. I have to be at my play. He said, we'll come. And that night, it was on the front page of the New York Post, Sophia and Carlo came to see House of Blue Leaves. <laughs> and the next day he calls me up at the Essex House again. I like your play very much. I want to buy your play for Sophia, Elizabeth Taylor, and Richard Burton. <laughs> I said, the zookeeper in Central Park is to be played by Richard Burton? <laughs> That's would be wonderful. And Sophia will play his sick wife? She'd be brilliant. Yeah, she'd be wonderful. <laughs> All right, he said, now go home and write this screenplay. And you can write it, you can write it while we're filming. I then had to start going for costume fittings. Albert Walski was the costume designer. Wow. Uh, they came to my apartment to see where I lived. Monticelli wanted to see where I lived. And Monticelli climbed up the four flights of my walk up on 10th Street and 4th Street, for which the rent was. It was 20 foot seal, a high ceiling with a skylight, wood burning fireplace, eat in kitchen, garden, windows looking out onto a garden, $32 a month. <laughs> Incredible. And Mario Monticelli said, We shoot here. <laughs> So I didn't have to leave my apartment. I didn't have to leave home. Sophia would come to me. I wrote in a bed scene. She comes in the door, he takes her into his bed, yes. <laughs> and
And we started work on it. And I, we had to go to the Italian consulate to meet the consulate general. I went with, with Sophia and, and Carlo and, and they gave toast in Italian and Monticelli talked and, you know, to our new star. And I said, this is a new planet. I mean, it's just not a new, it's a new planet. In the meantime, my play is going well. I've sold it to the movies. I'm in the process of selling it to the movies. And uh, about this time, my friend Mel Shapiro called me, and he had directed House of Blue Leaves. And he said, Johnny, I just got a call from, uh, from Joe Papp. Wait, can I have a glass of water? Just a glass of water. Mel said, Joe Papp just called me, thank you. And he said, he's going to do in the park this summer, Two Gentlemen of Verona. And Gaul McDermott, you know, the guy who wrote the music for Hair, is going to do the incidental music. And I thought maybe we could put a few songs in and kind of tighten it up. It's going to go on a bus around, a truck around the city. And I thought if we, you know, and it was a summer of great racial tension, this, you know, before the, the summer, the Shakespeare show in the park the summer before had been shot at and bombed when they took it up to, you know, when it took uptown. And uh, we said, he said, well, we take them this near little comedy about courtly sentiments of love will be, you know, a bazooka, it'll be hand grenaded. So he said, I think we should just, you know, use the lessons we've learned on, on Blue Leaves and cut it down to an hour and a half and uh, make it something to show and add a few songs to it. I said, that's great. I said, I can do that. And we were, I got you know, the shooting schedule. And I realized, and I started working. I went, to meet Joe. I went to meet them. I said, yeah, we can do this. And it was fun to do. And I was home. And I started making a, a schedule about getting what my, the shooting schedule was. So, and we're going to start rehearsing in, you know, we're in doing, we build the show in a workshop in, in the city. And I said, okay, I'll get a car to take me from Kennedy. I can go back and forth from filming to writing the show. It's perfect. This is what I was meant to be. This is the true me. And, and then I realized that I loved working on this show. And this is where the song comes. And we're getting, we're a week away from shooting. And I realized I have to be one or the other. And I went to bed. And I woke up about six in the morning, and I turned on the radio, and I heard James Taylor sing a song I had never heard before in my life. When you're down and troubled, and you need a helping hand, and that old north wind begins to blow. Um, and I burst into tears. You've got a friend. You've got a friend. They'll take your soul if you let them. And I sat up in bed, and I waited for 7 o'clock. And I, at 7 a.m., I called the Essex House. And Carlo answered, yes, hello. I said, oh, I said, oh, I said, oh, hi, this is uh, John. Yeah, yes, John. He said, I, I said, I, I just changed my mind. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the movie. He said, well, you're just nervous. Everybody's nervous. I said, no, no, I'm really not. I've been nervous. I'm not nervous now. I'm not going to do it. And he said, you better get up here. So I went up. Sophia did not come out. <laughs> and I said, I'm a playwright. You know, I'll write the screenplay of Blue Leaves. I'll, any help I can give. But I'm not, and I, I you know, I mean, the, the title of this evening is, I guess, you know, Inside the Lie. And I was living inside this lie of success, this lie. And he said, will you give me, he said, I see you're serious. He said, we're having scheduling troubles, getting, you know, sh getting a shooting schedule at, at JFK. He said, will you, we have to make a lot of changes if you leave. We won't shoot in your apartment. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, we, 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 would, uh, we were thinking of delaying shooting a week till we can get JFK straightened out at the airport. But if we can't get anybody in the end of another week, you will have to do it. I said, yes, but I said, I have to tell you, I'm not going to do it. Well, he said, you've signed a contract. I said, yeah, I won't honor it. You put me in jail. He said, you'll never act again. I said, fine. <laughs> and I went out, and I went down to the public and started writing that show. 
And we went on to win the, we did it for no money, went on to win the Tony. And Mortadella opened, it was made into a movie. Made into a movie. I mean, I was just reading a review. I looked in the, I Googled today to see what the review of Lady Liberty was. And it said, it's amazing that Sophia Loren still has a career after the, all the rotten movies she manages to make. <laughs> uh, I always was grateful to that song. I always wondered if James Taylor, I mean, Noel Coward says how potent is cheap music, but it's not cheap music. But just hearing that voice in my little about to be movie location at 6.30 in the morning saying, you've got a friend, they'll take your soul if you let them, don't you let them. And I watched that concert and I understood exactly why that song had the power to change my life. And uh, I know last year I finally did make my acting debut at uh, Atlantic Theater Company. And I have to say on opening night, I thought Carlo Ponti would come down and said, I have a contract here, you're not allowed to work. <laughs> and just to round it all off, I just got a call this week, two gentlemen of Verona, it's being done at the big Toho Theater in, uh, in Tokyo, directed by this terrific director, uh, Miyamoto, who did Pacific Overtures here a couple of years ago, he's a wonderful director, inviting me to the opening, which is December 7th, 19... <laughs> 2014. So uh, life is just back to being its real good old-fashioned shape. And Adele, I hope you know the story now. Thank you so much.